Welcome to Beersmith episode number 107. It's July 2015. Chris Graham, the president of More Beer, joins me this week to discuss chilling your work. Thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're offering six issues a year, up from four at a great discount. You can get a new discount code, which gives you 15% off everything they sell, including subscriptions and training. The new code is Beersmith2015. I encourage you to check out this great new magazine for homebrewers at beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code Beersmith2015 to get your 15% discount today. And also, Beersmith. Design great beer, brew with confidence, and brew your best beer ever with Beersmith homebrewing software. (laughs) Beersmith lets you create your own recipes from scratch or access tens of thousands of recipes found on the Beersmith cloud. Also, our desktop and mobile version work together seamlessly to make your brewing easier. Give Beersmith a try today by downloading the free trial at beersmith.com. Get your free 21-day trial today at beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. This week, my guest once again is Mr. Chris Graham. Chris is the president of More Beer and More Flavor, Inc. He teaches brewing at the world-renowned Seibel Institute. And we've had Chris on the show four times before, including last fall for episode number 91 on fermentation. Chris, it's uh, great to have you back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Brad. So uh, what have you been doing these last few months? I haven't had you on in a little while. Oh, gosh. It's, uh, it's summertime, so it's beer season. Uh, lots going on this summer. Had the NHC, going to be teaching at Siebel pretty soon. And uh, we have a ton of new releases happening uh, at More Beer. I, and I, my kids are two and a half now, so I am super busy all the time. You have twins, if I recall. I do, a boy girl twin. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, two and a half is an energetic time for them. You know, the, the terrible twos, uh, I'm sure it gets even worse, but it, it's a handful right now. O- only superseded by the terrible teens, I think. Oh boy. <laughs> and that only lasts like 10 or 15 years. So it's not, oh, don't want to know that Brad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well today we're going to talk a little bit about chilling your wort. And, uh, first let's talk about where in the bro- bre- brewing process we're talking about wort chilling, where it comes into play. Well, you know, it's, it's post boil, obviously pre fermentation. So, you know, we, we did all this stuff to do our boil, to drive off DMS, to, uh, I summarize our hops, get uh, improve clarity, sanitization, but we can't just add our yeast at these high temperatures. We got to cool it down. We've got to get it from, you know, roughly 212 down to somewhere in the 70s or lower for a safe uh, pitching temperature. Right. Obviously, you don't want to pitch uh, pitch your yeast into a bunch of hot wort, right? Exactly. That it, you know, anything probably above 110, you're going to kill the yeast 100. percent Anything actually even in the 90s and 100s, you're going to start killing part of the yeast, thusly not giving it a good chance of having an active fermentation. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a bunch of other benefits to chilling your wort as well. Why, why do you want to uh, try and get your wort chilled down as quickly as possible? I, I will say the number one reason I want to do it fast is to reduce risk. Um, Reducing risk of natural bacteria, wild yeast, all of those from getting a chance to take root in my wort and really control the fermentation process. Every wort probably has a certain degree of both in them, but it's such a small amount that it doesn't uh, affect the flavors. Mm -hmm. But the more you get, the more that is an issue. But there's a ton of other reasons. Um, You know, a good, fast chill will give you a great cold break. Uh, a lot of the proteins will coagulate and settle out even further from your hot break. Um, obviously reduces infections. It gets the pitching temperature right. So thusly, it actually makes your life easier. The faster you can add your yeast, pitch it, the, um, the less time you have. So you don't have to come back four hours later and check the temperature to know, can I add my yeast at this point? You could do it right away and just be done with your brew day. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't have some clarity implications as well. Absolutely. Um, the, the biggest one is, um, getting a good fast cold break uh, the protein change strain change will help those proteins settle out and not actually get to your fermenter, which thusly leads to better clarity. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we're going to focus on several different types of chillers in a moment, but let's start with, uh, some of the options. If you don't have a chiller, 
uh, starting with the old uh, extract method of just adding some cold water. You know, it, it really isn't a horrible method. If you are doing partial boils, so you're doing extract batches and say, let's say you're finishing a, a five gallon batch with three to three and a half or even less gallons of liquid in your mm -hmm. um, kettle, you're just topping up with water to get to the five gallon mark. Um, and it's actually a pretty efficient way to do it. You run some risks, you know, that cold water is, does it have bacteria or wild yeast living in it? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the more you can make sure your water source is good, the, the better off you'll be. But for a brand new brewer, it's, it's actually probably the most efficient, least expensive, easiest to do in your kitchen type method. Now, do you have to worry about trying to get, uh, you know, distilled water or something that's uh, already been filtered? It helps. Um, at minimum, a filtration would be great. Um, distilled or reverse osmosis water, you, you, um, if you're just doing the top up with it, it's no big deal. But it's, it's the void of most minerals and everything to where you want a fair amount of that for flavor profiles and for yeast health. So you wouldn't want the whole batch to be, say, distilled water, but the top-up water would be great to use something that you know is sanitary. So typically you're adding maybe two or three gallons. Uh, would he chill it in the fridge? Is that what you do? That's one way to do it. I, I knew a guy who did this religiously, and I thought it was a lot of work, but it, it never failed him. He would boil it one day, get it cooled down, and then into a fridge, and uh, in, in just the kettle, a second kettle he had, so it'd be nice and cold to top up with, and he'd be pitching within two minutes after boiling. Hmm. Uh, and another popular extract technique is uh, taking the whole pot and throwing it into an ice bath or maybe your, uh, your uh, tub or something with some ice in it. Exactly. Um, so very common method, uh, again, as a beginner brewer wanting to go fast is, so instead of adding cold, cold water, you're now just going to cool the whole boil down as fast as you can and and so if you're going to do this, use a lid. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see. Um, you know, the, the bathtub is full of bacteria, even if you scrub it really well. I'd rather no, see you No, mine's really it. clean, really clean. Yeah, I'm sure it is, especially with kids. Um, but I'd rather see you use like a party picnic tub or something like an outdoor tub that maybe isn't used as much so that it thusly is easier to, to maintain as, as clean as possible so that we're not introducing weird bacteria. Another very common thing I see, especially uh, the rest of the world, except for California in the wintertime, is uh, snow. Just mm -hmm. literally bring your kettle out to the snow bank, put it in there, chill it down nice and fast. Snow is probably pretty sanitary, um, so not, not much risk. Um, and uh, a, a relatively fast and easy. Now, just be careful when you're picking up an entire pot full of boiling liquid. That yeah, can that's be a risk. dangerous if you drop it. Very risky, actually. Um, so you poured it in the ice bath. Is there any uh, other considerations there? You, sh you mentioned covering it. Um, I've heard some people don't like to cover it because they're concerned about DMS. Uh, what's the trade-off there? The trade-off is what else you're bringing in. So if you're going to go to like a... So if you want to do a bathtub, and that's where I was referring to covering it, that's where I'd cover it. You're in a, an environment that has a lot of moisture, a lot of bacteria can live in a bathroom. Um, and so thusly, if you're going to bring your kettle to your bathroom, that's where I'd cover it. If you're going to go to snow melt, I probably wouldn't, or I would partially cover it. People want to be able to drive off um, compounds, mainly ones that, that cause DMS, during the cooling process when steam is, is trying to come off. Mm -hmm. So I get that concern. So you're ma mainly worried about when it's hot, really hot, right? It, when it's really hot. Now, hopefully we've driven off most of those compounds during the boil. So this hopefully isn't an issue. Um, uh Listerman used to do cooling overnights all the time, and he made a lot of award-winning beer uh, without that being an issue. And I think it was because he was driving off those compounds during the boil effectively. Yeah. So, I mean, if you do a good long boil, you know, 60 or even ideally 90 minutes, uh, it's probably less of a concern, right? Exactly. Yeah. But, the, but the key is, I'm just a big fan of reducing risk, reducing airborne things, because they're everywhere. Um, and they've affected my work before. That's the reason I'm like, okay, at least use tinfoil. Something to stop things from falling in. That way, tinfoil is good because it'll let most things come out, but it'll prevent physical things from literally falling into it. 
So if you're brewing outside like I, I do here and, uh, you know, the pollen's falling like snow, that's probably a good time to cover it up, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it does that in the spring, by the way. Yeah, I can oh. imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'm surrounded by trees. Um, what about some off the wall solutions like, you know, adding ice directly to your wort? You know, two things I've seen in the past, I haven't really seen this as a common thing lately, but adding ice is actually a great way to do it. Um, not too much bacteria or wild yeast are going to live through that freezing process. Some will, but, but most won't. So another fast way to cool it down, but you need quite a bit of it, um, to effectively cool you right. down. The other thing I've seen people use, uh, especially people with kitchen backgrounds, are these things for using to chill soup fast in, in industrial kitchens. Um, so, so what's that? I'm not familiar with that. I mean, I've seen that, you know, like the reusable ice cube kind of thing or ice Yeah, pack. they're, they're a, a, a plastic. They're usually probably, well, you can't see it, but they're, they're pretty big. They usually have multiple fins coming off of them to have more surface area. Um, they're meant for industrial kitchens, so they're meant to cool five gallons at a time. Um, they work pretty well, but they're plastic. Um, they're, you know, a bit of a pain to make sure they're going to maintain sanitary and not scratch. They have little nooks and crannies. So it wouldn't, those are just the off the wall ideas of, of chilling as well. So it'd be kind of like putting a ice pack, a plastic ice pack in there or something like that. Right? Exactly. But it is food grade. Cool. Cool. Um, so, uh, why are those solutions not really ideal when you start moving up from extract size batches to all grain brewing and you start doing, you know, full volume, you know, five, seven, eight gallon boils? It's the volume. Um, it's your ability to cool that wort down. Um, you just, you, one, you can't top up. So all those methods are gone Two, trying to chill five gallons in a snowbank is just going to take forever. You have a stagnant liquid. Um, you're just cooling the outside of the kettle, so thusly, it's just going to take a long time. Um, yeah, the bigger pot has less you, surface area, right? Exactly. So a few hours of chilling as opposed to probably less than an hour. So it's just not ideal. One, it's a waste of your time just standing out there, checking it. You're probably opening it, stirring it, doing all these things that are are giving a... a bad chance of not having extra bacteria and not having extra wild yeast affect your beer because those things are actually, once you hit like kind of a, a safety zone for them, somewhere in the, the low 100s, high 90s, they're going to love that temperature and environment. So anything that is active there for a long period of time is going to have a prolonged effect on your beer. So uh, let's talk about some uh, some of the more popular options. So w once you go to all grain or once you start doing full boils, um, uh, we'll start with a homebrew chiller, probably the most popular of which is the immersion chiller. Yeah, the immersion chiller is where almost everyone starts. Nowadays, there's a lot more information out there, but 20, 30, 50 years ago, even 10 years ago, and even today, I hear of people going out and making their first chiller. There's a perfect example of one. There's one right there, yeah, on the video. Yep. A lot of people will wrap them themselves around a corny keg out of just hardware store copper. Um, most people um, buy them at their local homebrew shop or mail order homebrew shops. They're not terribly expensive. You know, copper is an interesting commodity because way back 20 years ago, they were the cheapest thing you could do to chill. The price of copper has gone up so much that it, it's no longer always the cheapest option. In fact, we now make them out of stainless in addition. So here's to, uh, here's some commercial ones. I guess these are some ones you sell. These are ones we make and here's sell. Here's a stainless one, I guess. Exactly. You'll see a stainless one in there. And we fought doing a stainless one for a long time because stainless isn't as good of a conductor of temperature as copper is. Mm -hmm. However, after doing a bunch of experiments, we saw it was within a 5 to 10% um, ratio. So it wasn't like, oh, it's 80% ineffective. It was actually quite effective, just not quite as effective as copper. Much easier to keep clean, though, I would think. Right? Much easier to keep clean. Uh, anyone who's had an immersion chiller will t can tell you horror stories that that shiny copper doesn't look shiny copper, um, except for right after your batch. Uh, but then you go to use it again, you're like, oh, my God, that, that looks kind of ugly. This guy, but, it develops a nice patina, let's say. Exactly. But <laughs> Eventually, it'll it, turn green. I was going to say, it can be dangerous um, it, it, in those scenarios. Um you know, uh, high alkali, um, 
So just be, be sure to clean them off properly. But that's the beauty is they are easy to clean. The wart comes in contact with the exterior of them, so you can literally scour them down so that you don't have big buildup on them. Um, immersion chillers tend to be pretty heavy water usage chillers. Um, yeah, and they also... Maybe talk also, for a minute about how, how these things are used. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so, so if you want to bring up a picture, that's yeah, perfect. So literally, you have two hoses on there. One's going to be for a water inlet. And you're either going to hook that up to your kitchen sink via an adapter, or you're going to hook it into a garden hose. But either way, you're going to have water coming in, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have water exiting. So the water coming in is going to be cool. The water exiting, hopefully, is going to be hot, or at least warmer than what's coming in, depending on how fast you have that flow and how long of a coil you have and how hot your wart is at that moment. And then you just set it right in the pot, just like this, and, uh, and let it go, right? Exactly. And again, that's a perfect scenario to try to cover that pot, whether it's a notched lid or tin foil or just something to prevent things from falling in during this process mm -hmm. or, or flying in. As I saw the other day, as uh, some flies were going into one of my employees' kettles while I was cooling it. Nice. Uh, so that's an immersion protein. chiller. Protein. Exactly. So, so you're relatively stagnant. So the liquid isn't moving in there, the wart itself, the, just the liquid in the coil is. So it takes a while, usually 35, 45 minutes out here in California. Maybe it's cooler elsewhere where you have colder liquid uh, um, or water coming through. But that's the reason it's a bit slower. But it's very inexpensive and easy to get started with. Yeah, so here's here's one in action, I guess. Uh, exactly. Image for the video, yeah. Yep. So uh, so do you stir it while you're while you're working with it or no? Or you just leave it undisturbed? I know some people who do. I prefer not to. As you'll notice in the commercial chillers, especially the ones we make, we always put our coils up near the top of the liquid, mm -hmm. i.e. we're going to heat or cool the hottest part of the liquid. You get some density change while that's happening, so you get a little bit of convection in there to stir. Some people do open and stir. I'm not a big fan of that because you run the risk again. Um, or you can... Um, actually swirl the kettle with it if it's light enough for you to lift or swirl around the chiller inside of the kettle just to get a little bit of that stagnant liquid broken up so that you're you're getting access to the hot wart to cool it down yeah that's uh that's what i tend to do is just move the chiller a little bit just to get the hot spots out you know and that's yeah. about it I, I try not to disturb it too much though so. um yeah well and i have another method using a pump and I'll go through it a little bit later of using the immersion chiller. But if you have a pump, you can actually cool quite quickly with it. That's pretty cool. Um, often we're feeding the chiller from a garden hose or sink water that's not really cold enough. Um, how do you overcome that, especially in the summer where you might have, you know, fairly warm water going into the chiller? Well, the, where I work currently in terms of where our offices are is a great example of this. We're in California we're kind of a high desert area. So in the summer, we're up in the hundreds. Um, and then our water lines that feed our building are not too far underneath the asphalt of our driveway. Mm -hmm. So our groundwater is in the 70s um, in the summertime, usually. Uh, if not, sometimes I've felt it a little bit warmer, I believe. Um, so in those scenarios, most of us are going to go to a two-stage immersion chiller, meaning we have two of these heat exchangers, um, one sitting in a bucket of ice, um, that you run the water through just to chill the water down before it hits the immersion chiller that's in the wart. Mm -hmm. So that uh, that second stage cools cools the water down uh, and brings it hopefully below the temperature you're targeting, right? Exactly. Most of us, what we'll do is we'll do just regular. So let's say we're at 212 in our boil kettle. We want to get it down to 70 degrees we'll run that straight tap water through for the first 15 minutes to bring us from 212 to let's say 130 or 120 or something in that range then we will put our uh, second stage into an ice bucket so now we're cooling that let's say 130 degree wart down um because the big delta T, the big temperature differential, you have plenty of temperature differential. Even if your groundwater is 100 degrees, when you're at 212, that's still 112 degrees differential for chilling the initial part. Right. Uh, from my thermodynamics class, the rate of rate of chilling varies with the temperature differential. So at the beginning, you have a huge differential between the boiling hot wort and the and the water you're running through the through the cooler, right? And later exactly. on, you don't. So it starts to really slow down at the end. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, well, uh, a similar concept is something called a counterflow chiller. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah, uh, I have some pictures on there and different various setups. Yeah, I'll pull them um, up. Uh, just give me a few seconds and I'll have them for you, but go ahead. Perfect. The concept is you have a smaller diameter tubing running inside of a bigger diameter tubing. The smaller diameter tubing is mostly copper. It's a great conductor, but the outer can be more copper. It could be any other kind of metal, or it can be garden hose. It can be anything, but essentially you're going to have the wort flowing one direction in the inner tube, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have surrounding water going on the opposite direction, counter the flow of the wort, so that you get the best heat exchange. So uh, here's one here, and this uh, yeah, it's a little hard to see, but it's got a it's got a thinner tube going through the middle of the outer outer tube, right? Exactly. So the two connects that have the sanitary flanges, that's actually the inner tubing, mm -hmm. and then you can see the garden hose waters T in to the um, outer jacket, and so you flow them in opposite directions, and it's a very effective heat exchange. And uh, uh, it's kind of cool because you're, you're essentially transferring the wort at the same time as you're chilling it, right? Exactly. Usually most people use this as a one-pass chiller. So when you're talking, you, you have an immersion chiller, you sit it in the bath, you can put a thermometer in there and get a good understanding of what your temperature reading is. And, and I'll go back a second to say if you put a temperature probe in with an immersion Chiller, you might want to take a couple different temperatures because when water cools slowly, it stridates. So you end up with hot liquid mm -hmm. at the top, cool liquid at the bottom. And I've seen 40, 50 degree differentials between what I thought a kettle was based off of one temperature versus when you go to transfer it into your carboy. So here's one with a temperature gauge on it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. This is one that's quite popular. People use this on the outflow so that they can, and there's a ball valve there. So they are flowing their ward in to the bottom part of this um, chiller and it's coming out the ball valve and the temp gauge and they'll slow their flow down to get that in the temp range that they want it to while they fill their carboy, their conical or whatever they're filling up. So, uh, so you're filling the, filling the, the carboy or filling your fermenter while you're doing this, right? Exactly. And, and, you know, depending on your groundwater temp, uh, most of us are, are experiencing you're, you're doing like, uh, uh, almost a gallon a minute, depending on your groundwater. So it's relatively a fast chill relative to an immersion chill, which is more so, like 45 so you, minutes. to Yeah. Hour. I mean, you might, you might be talking maybe five, 10 minutes here to do the whole thing, right? Exactly. Nice. Uh, and then another variation is uh, called a plate chiller. What's a plate chiller? It's relatively similar in concept to a counterflow, but 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 slightly different. It's the concept is you have a bunch of these plates that are pressed, and in the press there's all these little squiggly lines of where the wort is going to flow through. There's one. And what here. you're doing is is increasing the surface area to the metal of the wort, so it, you get a lot easier chance, a lot faster heat exchange because you're just kind of spreading the wort out amongst this plate that has cool liquid on the other side of the plate. So if you can kind of imagine in these stacked plates, you have one plate that liquid's going to come through of the wort and then kind of surrounding that on both sides of those plates is water and then wort coming through and water on the outside of those wort coming through. So they're kind of a scattergram of each one of how the liquid's going to pass through but it's quite an effective, even faster than a counterflow heat exchange. So, uh, so these plates, uh, let me see here. So, so you're constantly moving the water, the chilling water is also constantly moving through this thing as well, right? Exactly. So as they go through, there's not like a direct line that it goes in and out. It goes in and gets passed through all these plates and, and going kind of all over the place spread real thin. But, um, it makes for the whole thing is effectively one big cooling block and one heat exchange where with counterflow or any kind of tube, you have some laminar flow happening. So, so you reduce exactly how much heat exchange you have going on. Plus it's linear. It goes in, goes in a direct path and comes out. Whereas this gets scattered all over the place. And there's pros and cons to that. A counterflow, in my opinion, is a bit easier to clean. Mm -hmm. It's a bit easier. Um, it'll, it'll probably never clog. Where with most plate chillers, 
eventually, not probably to most homebrewers' lives, but eventually it'll probably clog up on you because as you get sediment building up in this heat exchange, it's going to be hard for it to actually come out. Mm -hmm. But with both of these, the way I recommend sanitizing, not every time, but if, especially if you really got a fear that you have a bacteria living in them, is to put them in the oven. Take all rubber pieces, all Teflon, everything off of it, set it in a cold oven, turn it, or room temperature oven, turn it to 350, let it heat up, hold it there for an hour or so, then turn the oven off and just let it sit in there. Um, now, now sanitation cools down. Go ahead. Sanitation is really important for all three. You know, we talk about three different chillers already. Um, how do you sanitize the three? What's the best way to do it? Well, so that one I just described was an emergency sanitization. I, I fear I have a problem. But my day-to-day -day sanitization, typically on counterflows and, um, and plate chillers, is running a hot PBW solution through them, running water through them, boiling water through them, going counter the flow that I would normally go my water. Um, I've seen people do compressed air through them for for getting all the liquid out afterwards for storage. Um, those are your common ways of sanitizing those. The beauty of the immersion chiller is dunking it into the boil for the last 20 minutes of the boil is typically your sanitization. So you don't cleaning. have to don't have to do a lot with it. You got to you got to keep it clean obviously. But I was uh, going to say cleaning's typically afterwards with a scrubby getting all the solids off of it um, between batches. Um, do you need to have a pump to use a wort or uh, uh, I'm sorry, a plate chiller or a counterflow chiller? Need no is it really handy for those cleanings we were just talking about and the basic sanitizations? Absolutely. So you can set up a, a physical height drop between your kettle and what you're fermenting in mm -hmm. to pass through a counterflow or a plate chiller. That That's easy to do to have that kind of differential. But for your basic cleaning, your basic sanitizing, it's just more work to always have it go through that gravity, to have that kettle high enough mm -hmm. to do that, to clean it fast, um, it's just a lot of work to do it all via gravity. So very few people use those style chillers without having a pump. So most of them have a pump. Uh, well, a lot of them have pumps to move move between all the vessels, right? Exactly. I mean, a pump is very handy in your brew day overall, especially as you get into all grain. And then once you have one, adding a plate or a counterflow into your system is pretty easy. And by the way, if you currently use an immersion, or if you're thinking, what's my first um, heat exchanger, I'd get an immersion because if later you switch to a counterflow or a uh, plate uh, chiller, you can always use that um, immersion chiller to do a two-stage chilling, meaning if you're going to use those other kettles, well, great, you can still cool your groundwater um, to make that heat exchange in your um, counterflow or a plate and frame that much faster. So, I mean, that's a concern even with these other chillers, uh, whether you're using a plate or a counterflow chiller, is you still have to worry about the water temperature of the, of the water that you're chilling with, right? Exactly. And since they're usually one pass, you really want to make sure you get that right or so, you end up with too hot sitting in your fermenter. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you do if you do end up with a little bit too warm in the fermenter? You got to wait or... Are you, you on a second wait. pass? What do you do? It depends on really how bad you did it um, and, and how easy you can move from what you're in. Uh, if you're in a counter, uh, if you went through too fast and you're pretty warm and you're in a conical with valves and fittings, well, okay, it's pretty easy to hook a pump up to that and move it through there again. But if you're in a carboy, mm, who wants to try to siphon that out and run all that risk? You might just want to let that sit, and you might want to do some basic techniques to cool that carboy down, such as wicking, ice baths, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but but really, those are your, your kind of options if, if you didn't chill at the right speed. Now, when you talk about pro-brewing, most pro-brewers do use a plate or counterflow system. Why is that? The, almost all of them use a plate. Um, and they do that because it's fastest and they do it because theirs aren't brazed. So if you go back to the plate chiller image we have, that is just one big block of a bunch of plates, all, um, brazed, meaning kind of soldered or, or welded in a way, there we all go. brazing 
together. So you can see the ribs and you can see each one of those is a plate that's been folded over and braised on there. So a pros will look similar on the inside, but they'll be in a frame that have bolts that go through them that they take apart. And most breweries, depending on how frequently they brew, that's on a monthly or quarterly system to take every plate apart and clean them by hand because a fair amount of cold break sets up in them. Mm -hmm. So they have to disassemble it uh, periodically just to maintain it, right? Exactly. And if you ever talk to someone who does it, that's not the desired job at the brewery. That's uh, that's the one the, the, the low guy on the totem pole gets, huh? Yeah, my favorite story was a brewery that accidentally left a green scrubby pad in there when they reassembled it. Oh, boy. They had some bad beer for a while. <laughs> he probably uh, did not get promoted right away. Yeah, no, and that's the downside of putting the low man on the totem pole, cleaning the thing that probably has the biggest effect of sanitization. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think we covered the basic systems that are certainly most, most home brewers are going to see. Um, I, I was want to ask your thoughts on no chill brewing, uh, which is a, which is a system where you, you actually take the beer, I'm sorry, you take the wort and you let it chill slowly, uh, typically in a sterile plastic cube or something like that. You know, it's, it's not something I would do. I, I'm too risk adverse. Um, cause making sure that's sanitary and everything is just difficult for me to do. Plus you have to come back to it later and deal with everything where I like to get my brew day. Once it's done, I want it buttoned up. I want that yeast fermenting as fast as possible. So for me, it's not my cup of tea. However, I've had beers brewed that in that method that have been just fine. They've had very rig rigorous boils. That's one of the key things to do. They transfer mm -hmm. into those hot, maybe not at 212, usually with those sterile plastic cubes. they got to come in more like 180. But it's still hot that it's sanitized everything inside of them. So you're not really risking much bacteria input except for the air that makes up as the um, headspace cools. It's got to draw in some air. Um, so, and I've seen people do these in kegs. I've seen people do this in, in plastic cubes. Like I said, Listerman used to do that. Um, we're talking back in the late 80s, early 90s. I don't know if he still does it that way, but mm -hmm. tasted some of his beers quite good. So it is possible. It just means now your brew day is extended into the next day quite heavily from a pitching of the yeast and, and everything like that. Right, because you still at some point you got to take it out of the cube, you got to aerate it, and then you got to pitch yeast, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, I had some concerns about it personally, uh, with the no chill, uh, mainly from a DMS perspective, but I, I, I've had some beers and they taste great. So, um, so they must be doing something right. I think, I think you're right. The long boil is probably the key to, to mitigate the DMS risk there. Driving that then, out then. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course, uh, you need to sanitize well in order to make sure you don't end up with any problems. Exactly. Um, so, uh, Chris, do you have any other thoughts on chillers? Yeah, the, the one I haven't talked about yet is kind of a hybrid approach. Um, my friend Jamil came up with this concept, uh, geez, I don't know how many years ago, but it was kind of like the best, best of both worlds. He's also out here in California. He's even more um, hot area than we are, more mm -hmm. in the valley. And um, so he came up with the idea of, I've got a pump already, and I've got this immersion chiller. I could go counterflow or plate, but I, I, it's really, those are kind of a one pass concept and harder to sanitize. Why not start pumping the wort around and reintroducing it so that the liquid isn't stagnant? So we bent them up um, using some of our, our tubing benders, a third arm on his wort chiller. Okay. And all that arm does is allow the wort to come in through the lid and then it has just a turn so that it hits the wall of coil. And it actually does two things quite well. One, it, it'll start a slow whirlpool. More than anything, if you make a whirlpool, it'll actually kind of help you maintain that whirlpool. Mm -hmm. Two, what it's really doing is throwing this boiling liquid that's coming out of the ball valve on the bottom of the kettle against a wall of, of cold copper. So I, I, don't, um, I don't totally understand the setup. Can you explain it just a little bit more? Sure. So imagine you have a ball valve at the bottom of your boil kettle. Mm -hmm. And then you have an immersion chiller in your kettle that has the two arms for water in and water out. Sure. Then you have a third arm that goes up, down, and into the um, kettle with the, the arm of the chiller. 
and when it goes to where the wall of stacked coils are, it it turns and hits that wall of coil on the inside of it. Okay. So as the liquid comes out of the boil kettle, out of the ball valve of the boil kettle, through the pump, up to this third arm, and around, and just yeah, I'll pretend my fingers. So it's just are a copper. it's just a small recirculation. Basically, you're recirculating, right? Exactly, and the pump pushes the liquid into this wall of copper, sure. and it, I can literally watch my thermometer drop as I chill that way. Mm-hmm. And what I'll do is, I, I use that system quite a bit, and I will have a cooler of ice water um, with a submersible pump, and I will run, I'll, I'll turn the pump on around 10 minutes left in the boil to just sanitize all the tubing, the copper chiller that's in my boil is chilling, sanitizing on the outside and the inside, uh, in the inside of my, this little return, and the pump and the tubing and all of that. And then at the end, I have a notch lid that I put on my kettle. I hook my immersion chiller up to my um, garden mm-hmm. hose, and I run that, and I turn uh, the pump stays on, and so I'm recirculating the wort. And I'm putting um, water into my immersion chiller. And of course, you're um, chilling it as you're recirculating it too, right? Exactly. And then um, that I'll go from my high differential of 212. I'll, I'll get it down to say 130 or 120s pretty fast. Then I have a submersible pump that has garden hose fittings on it. And I put that in this bucket of ice water and I hook that into my immersion chiller instead of the groundwater. Mm hmm. And then I'll chill that down, and I've actually gotten it down into the 50s before, or even high 40s going that way to be able to do a lager. And nice. I just keep chilling it until I get to the temperature I want it to be at, which is really convenient. And then I transfer over to my um, conical or carboy or whatever I'm fermenting in. Yeah, we haven't really covered that. Is there any special considerations when you are brewing a lager uh, and trying to chill down to those temperatures? That's that's the hardest part is getting your wort down to those temperatures. So the only way I've ever successfully done it with a chiller all the way to that temperature is exactly what I just described, where I have this mm-hmm. whirlpool immersion chiller and I have this big ice bath of water that I use to do kind of that second half of the chilling with to get it way down there. The other way is to have a refrigerator. Yeah. So you're you're going to use your immersion chiller or your plate and frame or your um, counterflow to get you to some temperature. Put your fermenter into once you're then go to your fermenter and then put that in the fridge and then try to get you down as fast as possible before you pitch your yeast. Cool. Cool. Well, that's some good advice. Um, well, I wanted to take a couple of minutes here uh, to just give you a chance to talk about what's new at More Beer. Well, we have a bunch of new products coming out this summer, so mm-hmm. just keep looking for those on our website. Uh, get on our mailing list. Which course, more, more, morebeer.com. I just pulled morebeer.com. Yeah. Our mailing list signups at the bottom. We'll send you everything that's new coming out. We mm-hmm. promise not to bother you too much. Um, but we also just opened a new showroom, um, which is somewhat near the Oakland Airport. So if you're ever traveling to Northern California, uh, please come and visit us. Um, and we have a, a new line of sculptures coming out um, in the a mid-July range uh, that will feature touchscreen, programmable mash, uh, programmable timers, um, so just ultimate and repeatability uh, for all grain brewers. Cool. And then you said that's coming out in uh, another month or two? Exactly. Awesome. Um, anything else you wanted to, to mention? No, just wanted to thank you for having me on. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. Always great to have you on, Chris. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. All right. Thanks, Brad. And again, uh, today, my guest is uh, Chris Graham from More Beer. He's the president of More Beer and uh, uh, More Flavor, Inc. He is also uh, a teacher at the World Renowned Cybel Cy- Institute. Uh, and we've had Chris on several times before. And Chris is also a former board member of the AHA and the Brewers Association. Uh, Chris, thank you again for coming on the show. Thanks, Brad. Thanks again to Chris Graham for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, where you can get your 15% discount on their magazine or anything in their store if you use the offer code BEERSMITH2015 when you shop at beerandbrewing.com. Again, use the offer code 
Beersmith 2015 and get your subscription now at beerandbrewing.com. And also, Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers. The less you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Down your, download your free 21-day trial today from beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.